This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 41b, Proof of the Symmetric Matrix Theorem. The purpose of this video is to provide a proof of the symmetric matrix theorem that we saw in Lecture 41. This proof will introduce some facts about complex numbers, but otherwise this proof relies only on the ideas presented earlier in this course. So what is the symmetric matrix theorem? It says that a square n by n matrix A is orthogonally diagonalizable if and only if A is symmetric. So in lecture 41, we proved that if A is orthogonally diagonalizable, then A is symmetric. So in this lecture, we're going to prove the reverse. We're going to prove that if A is symmetric, then A is orthogonally diagonalizable. So let's start by letting A be a symmetric n by n matrix with real entries. And the first thing we need to prove is that all of the eigenvalues of A are real numbers. We're going to need to establish some facts about complex numbers and expand our definition of inner product to include vectors with complex entries. So let z equals x plus iy be a complex number, where x and y are real numbers. The conjugate of z, written z bar, is z bar equals x minus iy. So we reverse the sign of the imaginary part of this complex number. And notice that z times z bar works out to be x squared plus y squared, which is a real number. Now the adjoint of a matrix is the transpose of its conjugate, or equivalently, the conjugate of its transpose. We write A star is A conjugate transpose. And when V and W are vectors with complex entries, we expand our definition of inner product like this. We write the inner product of V and W, a common notation for this is angle brackets with V comma W inside. That's V star times W. So the adjoint of V, which is the transpose of V, a row vector containing the complex conjugates of the entries of V, and so that's v1 bar times w1 plus v2 bar times w2 plus 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 vn bar times wn. So since z times z bar is real for any complex number z, the inner product of v with itself is a real number. And so we can therefore define the length of v as the square root of the inner product of v with itself. Now remember, our first goal for the proof of the symmetric matrix theorem is to prove that a symmetric matrix has all real eigenvalues. So let's let A be an n by n real symmetric matrix. And one consequence of that is that A is equal to its adjoint, A equals A star. Now let's let lambda be an eigenvalue for A. And keep in mind that as far as we know at this point, lambda might be a complex number. And we'll let V be an eigenvector associated with lambda so that A times V is equal to lambda times V. So we're going to compute here the length of AV squared. So that's the inner product of AV with itself. And our definition of inner product is that that's AV adjoint times AV. Adjoint has similar properties to transpose that we've studied earlier in this course. So AV parentheses adjoint is going to be V star A star AV. And remember, A is a real symmetric matrix. So A star is the same as A. And so that's V star times A squared V. Now we also have AV is equal to lambda V. And so A squared V is going to be lambda squared V. And so continuing from the previous line, we've got V star A squared V a squared v is lambda squared v, and then lambda squared is a scalar, so we can pull that out. So we get lambda squared times the inner product of v with itself, or in other words, lambda squared times the length of v squared. But that means that lambda squared is the length of av squared divided by the length of v squared. That means that lambda squared is a non-negative real number, and that means that lambda has to be a real number. And since lambda was an arbitrary eigenvalue of a, this proves that all of the eigenvalues of a are real numbers. And so now that we know this, a is a matrix with real entries. We're interested in talking about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A, and we can safely now assume that all of those are real numbers. So we don't need to talk about complex numbers at all from here on out. So now the main proof that A is orthogonally diagonalizable is going to be by induction. In our base case, any one by one matrix is clearly orthogonally diagonalizable. And so we're going to assume that any n minus one by n minus one symmetric matrix is orthogonally diagonalizable. And we want to prove that the n by n matrix A is orthogonally diagonalizable. So let's let lambda be an eigenvalue for A, which we now know is real, with associated eigenvector V. And if necessary, we'll normalize V to make it be a unit vector. Let H be the subspace of Rn spanned by the vector V, and we'll consider the orthogonal complement of H, H perp. As we've done before, we're going to use Gram-Schmidt to find an orthonormal basis for H perp. Let's let U1 through Un minus 1 be the vectors in this basis. The subspace H has dimension 1, 
in Rn, and so the dimension of H perp is n minus 1. And let's let capital B be the n by n minus 1 matrix that has these u vectors as its columns. And let's consider the matrix B transpose A B. Since A is symmetric, it turns out that this n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrix is also symmetric. If we take the transpose of B transpose A B, remember that when we apply transpose, that reverses the order of the multiplication, and that works out to just be B transpose A B again. And using our induction hypothesis, since this is an n minus 1 by n minus 1 symmetric matrix, this matrix must be orthogonally diagonalizable. Let's write B transpose AB as PDP transpose, where D is diagonal and P is an orthogonal matrix. That's our orthogonal diagonalization of B transpose AB. Now let's consider the matrix K equals BP. B is n by n minus 1, P is n minus 1 by n minus 1, so K is n by n minus 1. And when we multiply k transpose times k, remember k was bp, so that's bp transpose times bp. Transpose reverses the order of multiplication, so that's p transpose b transpose bp. And that's i because both b and p are matrices that have orthonormal columns. So k transpose k is i, and that means that k has to have orthonormal columns. And now we're going to construct a yet another new matrix, capital U, is the matrix whose columns are the vector V as the first column, and then the rest of the columns are the columns of K. So K has n minus 1 columns, so U is an n by n matrix. And remember that V, we haven't seen the letter V in a while, V was an eigenvector for A corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda. So why is U an orthogonal matrix? Well, V is a unit vector. And the columns of K are orthonormal, so those are all unit vectors. The columns of K are orthogonal because they're orthonormal. And so why is V orthogonal to the columns of K? Once we establish that, that will show that U is an orthogonal matrix. Well, remember that the columns of B were an orthonormal basis for H perp, and H was the span of the vector V. Now V transpose K is V transpose times BP. We can regroup those parentheses to get V transpose B times P. Since V is orthogonal to the columns of B, V transpose B is the zero matrix. And then that means that V transpose K must be the zero matrix. And that's why V is orthogonal to the columns of K. All right, now we're going to compute U transpose A U. So U transpose has V transpose as its first row, and the columns of K become the rows of K transpose. And those are the remaining rows of U transpose. We've got A in the middle. And then u is v as its first column, and the columns of k as the remaining columns. And it turns out that when you multiply matrices like this, you get four blocks in the result. The upper left-hand corner, that's a single entry, is v transpose av. The remainder of the first row is v transpose ak. The remainder of the first column is k transpose av. And then the remaining n minus 1 by n minus 1 part of the matrix is k transpose ak. Let's work out each of these four blocks separately. So V transpose AV works out to be lambda. V transpose AK works out to be 0. K transpose AV works out to be 0. And K transpose AK works out to be D, where D was the diagonal matrix in the orthogonal diagonalization of B transpose AB from earlier. And so that means that U transpose AU is a diagonal matrix. The upper left-hand corner entry is lambda, and the remainder of this diagonal matrix is the diagonal matrix D. So let's give this diagonal matrix a name. Let's call it capital sigma. So we have U transpose A U equals sigma, but U is an orthogonal matrix, which means that U transpose is U inverse, and that means that we can rewrite this equation as A equals U sigma U transpose. So sigma is a diagonal matrix, U is an orthogonal matrix, and A equals U sigma U transpose, that's an orthogonal diagonalization of A, and that proves that A is orthogonally diagonalizable, and that completes the proof. Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.